Well, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, this picture here shows the at least say the power plant in Iceland. It's one of the largest geothermal power plants in the world, and it's the playground for the Carfix uh, project. Here we have captured CO2 directly from the atmosphere and from concentrated source within the power plant. We dissolved it in water, pumped it into the ground, and mineralized the CO2 within uh, two years of injection. What I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to start by reviewing past, present, and future CO2 of the atmosphere and emission to the atmosphere and what we can do about it. Um, last part of the second half of the talk will be focused on the CARFIX project. Let's first start now with the reviewing the uh, CO2 of the atmosphere, past, present, and What's shown here is the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere versus time, going 800,000 800, years back in time and 100,000 into the future. And shown here is the CO2 concentration in air bubbles and ice in Antarctica. And what is quite dramatic here, we can see that during the warm spells or interstitial, the concentration is a little bit under 300 ppm. And then during the difference between the warm spell and the cold spells or the ice age is about 100 ppm. Now, what we have done as humans, we have raised the, the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere from 280 to uh, uh, the concentration as it was recorded at Mauna Loa last month uh, to 420. So it's a quite an experiment that we as humans have made on Earth. Now what is shown here is what happens if we burn fossil fuel at the past decades rate increase and do nothing about it. And then we get all the way up here at the peak emission in 250 years time. Uh, and then slowly and surely the CO2 will dissolve, you know, the emission will decrease because of lack of fossil fuel. And then it will dissolve in the CO2, atmospheric CO2 will dissolve in the ocean. And then the, the carbonates in the oceans will dissolve, including the corals. And then weathering of carbonates on the continent will bring it further down here. And then slowly and surely weathering of silicates on, on Earth, on the continents and the oceanic islands. And, will bring the, um, the CO2 down to pre-industrial level in 500,000 years to a million years time. Now, the consequences of this are probably familiar to you that uh, we can um, uh, doubling the pre-industrial value to 650 ppm will cause three degree warming and runaway melting of the glaciers with these consequences on sea level rise. And at the peak emission here, the acidification of the ocean will result in a pH 0.8 drop in the pH of the of the ocean. So the the what we all our actions as human beings over the next years and decades is to stem this emission of CO2 to the atmosphere to shave the curve and make sure we don't go this path, but we go this path down to some bearable level. But the thing is that um, this is going to be tough politically over the next uh, decades because there's not an inst instantaneous decrease in atmospheric CO2. You know, the, 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 it takes time to re-equilibrate the system. Well, what's shown here is the total man-made global emission by source um, shown here in gigaton CO2 um, uh, from the Industrial Revolution up to the 2017 when preparation of the IPPC report uh, were, were done. And we can see here the incredible rise in emission from burning of fossil fuel and the rapid rise here and, and peaking here at uh, 2017 in total over four, 40 gigatons of CO2, including the land use change. But also shown here is the 1.5 degree target by IPPC report that came out in October 2018 and so this is an astronomical speed that we have to either stop emitting or being net neutral by 2050. Now, this slide shows temporary reduction in daily global CO2 emission during the COVID-19 forced confinement. And the units are a bit different from uh, the last slide where we have here now mil million tons of CO2 per day. And you can see here the maximum, the 
we, when we have 100, that's when you add up all the days in the year, you get actually 365 days, you get uh, actually 37 gigatons of um, annual emission. Now, this is shown here for the last decades, and this study actually came out just a few weeks ago. And what's shown here is that the COVID-19 forced confinement cost us 17% at the maximum uh, confinement in uh, Europe and China and US, and causing a major dent in the emission, Un uh, underscoring that this can be done, but it's a, it's a major effort. And then here on a, on, a, on a more on a daily scale, we can see this here that when China starts to close up, they cause this first dent here, and then China starts to open up again, and then there was a rise, and then Europe and and US took over and, and causing a dent in this and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, what is shown also on this slide the, are the dents the former crisis have made in the emission. There's the first oil crisis, the second oil crisis, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and, uh, and then the financial crisis. And, and what we can see is that very rapidly we climbed up here after the financial crisis in 2008 and uh, not in a very sustainable way. So that's something that we have to make sure we, we do when we climb out of, 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 of this event. Now, this is again the, uh, the uh, IPPC report, and they've, they've suggested two paths to get carbon neutral by 2050. It's the most optimistic part here, path one, and then path four, the most pessimis pessimistic one. And we can see in this one, we, fossil, you know, we, we phase out fossil fuel rapidly by, by 2050, and even agriculture, forestry, and other land use uh, switches from being emitting to actually capturing air directly from atmosphere via the vegetation. And, and, uh, and this is probably a very uh, wishful thinking. This is probably more pragmatic. I mean, we are here now at 2020. And then, you know, it will take time to phase out fossil fuel, and it's going to be hard to get agriculture, forestry, and other land use sectors, you know, actually negative, you know, like, like what we have here. And then we grossly overshoot in, uh, in 2050. So we have to pull CO2, past CO2 emission and present CO2 emission at that time out of the atmosphere a long time. And look, these numbers are huge. If you average, if you integrate this and you distribute it over this, you can see it's up close to 10 gigatons of CO2 per year. So it is a astronomical talk, but astronomical task. So what this backs, you know, what, what this back? It's bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and direct air capture and storage. And that is actually shown here on this diagram bioenergy, then, for example, we can plant trees, and f for the first part of their life, there's a net fixation of CO2 in the tree trunks and the leaves, and um, before they reach steady state and start to net, to net emission, we cut the trees, we put them to a power plant or, or smelters, we burn the, the trees, use the energy and we capture the CO2 and then do carbon capture and storage and we store CO2 for hundreds of years or even millions of years in the ground where we pulled it out of the short term cycle and actually put it into the long term cycle. Now direct air capture and storage rather than using biomass to capture the CO2 we have some man-made structures with an absorbent for example A mines where the CO2 is absorbed on an A mine then you need some energy source actually to pull the air through here, and you need an energy source to, to desorb the CO2. And, uh, and then you have to take the CO2, you have to compress it, and then pull it back into the ground, and uh, where it's stored for hundreds or even millions of years. But what's important by this, uh, by, by DAX, is that it's independent of the CO2 source. For example, CO2 that's emitted in New York can be captured a couple of days later in, later in Iceland. And then uh, we, we can use uh, We have to use renewable energy for this and then can be stored in CO2 for a, for a long time. And I can see that in the future that uh, geothermal power plant will be built, for example, in Iceland is simply for for um, cleaning the, the atmosphere. For that, we need a, 
a now what is carbon capture and storage? This is one of the first um, CCS projects. It, it, it took place here in the Utsira formation at the Sleipnir site here west of Norway, between Norway and Scotland. And what Statoil was doing, the, the Norwegian Stat state company, they were pulling natural gas out on a formation here below the Utsira formation. They were bringing it up to the, the uh, platform the CO2 concentration was too high for the market in Europe, so they had to strip it out of the CO2. And at that time, there was a carbon capture and storage offshore tax in Norway, about $50 per ton of CO2 emissions. So there was an incentive to do something about it. So they used A mines to capture the CO2 out of the gas stream, compress it to a liquid state, and they inject it into the Utsira formation here. Now, the Utsira formation is mostly quartz sandstone with saline fluid in it. And because of the geothermal gradient, the liquid 2 CO2 warms up when it gets here deep into the, into the formation. And the supercritical CO2 is less dense than the saline fluid here, so it has a tendency to rise to the surface. And during that path, there's some capillary trapping of the CO2 in the formation. Eventually, it r rises up to the cap rock, which is impermeable to CO2 and keeps the CO2 physically down there. And over time, long time, there is actually some dissolution of the supercritical CO2 into the saline fluid, and then that fluid becomes more heavy, and then there will be finger of CO2, and then it will be sinking. And if there is some source of calcium, magnesium, and iron, there will be some mineral storage of the CO2. Now, when we were thinking of carpex in, in Iceland, and, and Iceland is located here on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and you can see that all these lineations here, these are transfer fault on the ridge. So if you're going to inject into basaltic lava flows on, on, the, on the ridge, you can't use a buoyant fluid. So um, that's what we do here at the Carpex site. We decided to dissolve the CO2 in water because this is just in the middle of the rift zone going through Iceland. So what we do by the Carpex method, we co-inject water with a compressed gas, which is compressed at the 30 bar pressure. You know, it goes down the well, down to about 200 to 300 meters, where we have a sparger creating small bubbles. And they have a buoyancy force, but there, we need a critical velocity of the water to open the buoyancy force and force the bubbles downstream here. Now, the CO2 in the gas bubbles diffuse through the bubble walls and into the water. And also, as the bubbles descend because of the critical velocity, the total pressure gets larger and larger, and the bubbles get smaller and smaller, and eventually all the CO2 is dissolved in the water and enters the, the uh, formation water or our target, target rock as a more dense fluid. Now, the, uh, the CO2 is dissolved in the water. It's mostly aqueous CO2, but some of it dissociates into bicarbonate and H+, and by that acidifying the water on the pH, depending on the pressure, is somewhere between 3.6 and 4. Now, as the CO2 starts to interact with the rocks, protons are, are consumed with, by the dissolution, are slowly raising the pH of the, of the water, and the dissolution of the rocks releases the divalent cations, magnesium, calcium, and iron, and also some aluminum and silica. Now, this is shown here also for the magnesium-rich olivine and the iron-rich olivine in the same way, consuming protons and re releasing the divalent cations. Now, over time, there is some uh, bicarbonate no, carbonate forming, and then the calcium, magnesium, and iron canoe hook up with the carbonate, forming calcium, magnesium, iron carbonates, or mixture thereof. Now, there's a huge um, role for geochemists in this, because we have to uh, model this and fine-tune the system in such a way that the, the aluminum and silica does not steal away the magnesium and iron cations and form clays rather than carbonates. And this is something that we have uh, spent a lot of energy on, especially in the early stage of carpex. Now, also, uh, we have been developing uh, uh, using calcium magnesium isotopes, stable isotopes, to indirectly prove mineralization. And not only that, but also uh, the rate of mineralization. And that is a very exciting part of the geochemistry here. 
Now, on the contrary, here in the sedimentary basin, the reactions are rather simple. You simply dissolve ports, not releasing cations, or not consuming much of a, 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 the H plus ion, you know, so preventing mineralization. Uh, and this shows the relative trapping mechanism for, for uh, here, the typical sedimentary basins, where your person trapping mechanism is just time since injection stops. And then in the beginning, it's mostly structural trapping. And then with time, there is more and more residual trapping or capillary trapping. And then as the supercritical CO2 dissolves into the fluid, there is more and more of it is, is dissolved. In, in the fluid and make it heavier than anything. And maybe some time, after a long time, there might be some mineral trapping. Now, the situation is completely different for reactive rock or a cloud site, where we have solubility trapping in just in 10 minutes. And then we have mineral trapping in, 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 in less than two years. We have about 95% of the CO2 be, being trapped. And this one has all been very, very published. And, and, and you can see some of the references here. And um, and so Reykjavik Energy at that time decided because of the successfulness of, or, uh, of Carpex, what we refer to as the pilot project, they decided to go industrial scale on this. And just to note the different in time scales here. And, and you can see here, this is our playground to the Hedley City Power Plant. And um, Reykjavik Energy injects about 25 million tons of used geothermal brine at about 80 degrees C into the rock each year to more than 70 meters meter depth where the rock temperature is higher than 250 degrees C. So this is really pushing it towards a very high temperature, and that's going to be an interesting experiment. And since uh, uh, June 2014, you know, Reykjavik Energy has been, well, actually Reykjavik Energy and Carpix has continuously injected gas, dissolved gases into, into this stream. And um, this shows you the power plant is somewhere here. So we capture the CO2 in a scrubber, you know, at, at the surface. We, we inject the gas charged water with both CO2 and H2S. And, and that goes down here. And along with it, we, we inject the geothermal brine or uh, effluent water, spent water. And then we stick it here deep into the hot geothermal reservoir where the temperature is 250 degrees C. Then it kind of migrates um, from the injection well towards the monitoring wells where we can capture and monitor the fluid and measure the concentration of tracers and isotopes. And, and it turns out that this is mineralized within the majority of the CO2 gas is mineralized within a uh, uh, few months. And what's happening here is we kind of stick a cold finger into the system, relatively cold, 80 degrees compared to 250. So there's a possibility of thermal cracking. There's also a possibility of hydro cracking because we ramp up the pressure of the injection fluid to nine bars. And plus the density difference between this fluid and the fluid here within the system, there's a possibility of hydro cracking. And then further along, there's a possibility of micro cracking. And we have actually uh, had some induced seismicity and actually some fracturing here, which is good for carpex because the the uh, injected fluid is is more dense than the than the fluid here in the formation. Uh, so if we, but but uh, now how much does all of this cost? On-site cost per ton injected CO2 and H2S is at twenty-five dollars per ton at Hetlisay, and most of the cost is is involved with the with the capture. Uh, and this is a very good price. It's in the lower end of this price because uh, according to the Global Carbon Institute, the conventional CCS cost range somewhere from 30 to 110 dollars uh, per uh, ton. Here you can see the incentive for the heavy emitters in Europe to capture CO2. And in euros per ton of CO2 emitted, and here we, this uh, European Union emission trading scheme started in 2005, and then we go all the way up to the, to, to the 2010 here. And you can see in the very beginning, the price was, was um, you know, there was incentive to push the price up, but then, you know, there was a 
too many quotas on the market and the, the price fell down. And this was very bleak time here during this period here from 2012 to 2018 when we were trying to get some heavy emitters involved in our project. But recently the price has gone up considerably. And when I looked um, this morning, the price was um, uh, 23 euros per ton of CO2 emitted. And note that we are doing this in the CARPEX at the Hadley side for, 2000, um, for uh, $25 per ton of CO2. So, so we, we are just about there. Now, in US, there was federal law passed uh, last year, you know, for, uh, um, for tax credit for uh, those uh, companies that are injecting into sale and reservoirs, similar to the Sleipner site in, in Norway. They get uh, 50 euros per ton of CO2 uh, injected. But if you're using it for enhanced oil recovery, then you get uh, half of that uh, for your effort. Now, how is carbon capture storage doing worldwide today? You know, in 2017, there were 17 large scale CCS facilities and four coming on stream in 2018. And these uh, 21 facilities were capturing 37 million tons per ton of CO2 per year. But actually, at the same time, we were emitting 37 billion tons of CO2 per year. So in total, we were capturing uh, um, less than 0.1% of the camp, uh, carbon emitted. So we clearly, we have to do much better in terms of carbon capture and storage. Now, if we're not fast enough to phase out use of fossil fuel, and we're not building carbon capture and storage plants fast enough, we have to do a significant amount of direct car air capture directly from the atmosphere. And that is exactly what we're doing here in what we call, referred to as the CARPEX two project where we collaborate with Carp uh, with Climeworks from Switzerland on direct air capture. And the storage uh, the plant is down there. And, uh, and it started in 2017. And uh, what we have here is the, this unit here, which can store about uh, 50 tons of CO2 per year. Of course, tens and hundreds of these units can be stacked uh, closely together. But this one has been operating since October uh, 2017. Um, so now this unit needs energy to draw in air, you know, ambient air, and then later on, um, you know, to desorb the CO2 from the amine absorbent. We do that by heating up the amine, and that heat is needed in terms of energy. And then later on, when the CO2 is desorbed and then that one is compressed and then later on injected into the generic um, carpic stream, downgoing stream, where the CO2 will be mineralized within uh, months. Now, this is a huge task, and as you can see here, and the question remains whether we have enough energy and whether we have enough land space, land space to carry out this task. And you can see how this is from the Climework website. And when where they are trying to calculate how much area, physical area, we need for eight gigatons of CO2 per year capture directly from the atmosphere. And you can, of course, stack these units, tens and hundreds of them together to have a, like a block of it. And that will confine the space. And, and the space needed for that kind of a capture would be about 16,000 square kilometer per square kilometer. And that's similar to the glaciers in Iceland or the state of Connecticut in the US. If you go for afforestation, you can see the size of it is humongous, is on the scale of Europe. And we can't go there just, just by this method. I mean, because simply it's competing with the area for food protection and for humans living on Earth. So we have to do combination of these um, bioenergy and backs and also enhanced weathering. And, and we have to play with all of these for the direct air capture. Now, to summarize, I want to say the following. That in every move we take and every step we take on Earth in the future, we have to be more um, sustainable. The COVID-19 has taught us a lesson and shows us that we can make a significant dent in the CO2 emission. We just have to be careful when we go back to normal that we do it in a sustainable way. 
Now, the carbon capture storage will be needed to meet the United Nations uh, climate goals. The technology is there, but the financial model has been lacking. We need more incentive to build an erect structure for CCS. Direct air capture is feasible and may prove to be essential to global climate goals uh, in the second half of this century. Also, what the CARFIX project has shown us that when we perturb the natural systems, the rate of water rock interactions are much faster than we have thought until now. Now, this um, this talk should have been there should be 20 to 30 people on this talk because this has been a tremendous uh, group effort and we've been blessed with good funding during this uh, whole time. And thank you very much for your attention.